You know, when I think about what lies ahead for First Baptist Blanchard, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is God's promise that we really haven't seen or heard the things that God has in store for those that love him. But uh, we're not going to stick just with that general because uh, proposition because what God tells us is that we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And so we take that which lies behind and uh, the faithfulness and the devotion and the dedication of all who have been a part of this body of believers. And we build upon that as this and that as we, uh, as we move forward. And so much lies out there, and for us, it's uh, a recognition that this place is to be a place where we both worship God and we grow through discipleship, and it is to be a place that sends us outside these doors. Uh, in Blanchard, in Louisiana, in North America, in the world where we're called to share and show him with any and everybody that we encounter. We live by words. Words are the means by which we communicate. And the spoken word, the written word, is things that we share with the world around us. We use them to direct. We use them to connect. We use them to instruct and so many other things. Sometimes we find that the words that we have are just not sufficient. We simplify it by saying our words are just not enough. Today I want to share that message with you, but it's one that comes from Jesus himself, who said that sometimes mere words are not enough. Or perhaps put another way, that saying the right words isn't necessarily enough. We have been sharing and looking at uh, this matter of belief. A couple of weeks ago we shared the story of Jesus and Nicodemus, this one who came to him at night, and Jesus shares with him that you must be born again, and goes on to explain what that means, and sharing the verses that it through belief, sincere true belief, that we're given an eternal life that overcomes spiritual death. Last week, we focused on the story of Jesus and Lazarus, a dear friend of his. He goes, Lazarus is dead. He's met by Martha. Martha says, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. He said, well, he'll live again. Martha thought he meant the resurrection at the last day, and Jesus took that comment and that opportunity to share with her, no, I am the resurrection and the life. If you believe in me, you'll never die. And he asked Martha the all-important question, do you believe this? And we talked about that belief and what it means, and most importantly, there's not simply acknowledging the existence of Jesus Christ, placing our faith in him as the Son of God. It's acknowledging him as Lord of our life. You see, both of those Sundays, what we shared were part of transformation, being moved to what we are not unto ourselves. And we're going to share that throughout this year. Our focal verses come from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And I hope you keep them marked. I hope you mark them. I hope over the course of this year that we learn them together and, and see all of the lessons that come from these two verses. But there we read these words by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, some of you may be asking inwardly never to be spoken outwardly. Are we going to talk about that all year? And the answer is yes, we are. And the reason is because Scripture talks about it from the first page to the last. This is a book that tells us who God is, and in doing that, it calls us to be transformed. God called out his people of Israel. He said, you live by my laws, you remain faithful to me, you'll attain righteousness, you'll be transformed. The prophets talked about it. God said, go out there and tell them to repent, and when they repent, they'll be transformed. Jesus walked this earth. He shared, come to me, believe in me, have a new life and be transformed. The writers of the New Testament continued in that, sharing that about our call to transformation. And we're going to share it today and talk about it today but we're going to hone in on one particular part you see we begin this year in focusing on true belief now we do that because you can't get to the transformation of the daily life and the spiritual life if you don't first address regeneration or being converted and many if not most here today may have experienced that accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior 
But together we need to understand better what it means to be regenerated, what it means to be transformed, and a transformation that shows itself day by day, week by week, month by month, and year by year. You see, transformation begins in belief, but it's not simply a professed belief. It's a belief that's really deep in the heart, a genuine, sincere belief. And Jesus talked explicitly about that on several occasions. Today we're going to share from Matthew chapter 7. And in fact, almost all of our verses today will come from that focal passage for this sermon. And as you turn there, let me just kind of give you a little scene setting here. And Matthew 5, 6, and 7 are what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest recorded sermon that we have of Jesus. And in it, he shares a lot of different things. He talks about what we're called and how we're called to act. He talks about the Beatitudes, the blessed are that we are familiar with. He gives us what's called the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And, and within all of those teachings, Jesus reaches this point where he talks about the choice that everyone has to make. And it's not simply a choice to accept the, the ethical part of what he has shared. It's a choice to accept who he really is and all that brings with it and all that demands of us. And it's in that context that we're going to move to a very important lesson about how to enter the kingdom of God. Because contrary to what a lot of folks say today, all roads don't lead to the top. If you've got your Bibles open there, we'll begin by sharing verses 13 and 14. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And if you read all of the Sermon on the Mount, you'll see the setting there is Jesus has a large crowd around him. And, you know, he's positioned himself to where he can speak to all of them, and they're able to hear him. And he's teaching these lessons and walking through. And if you go back a little bit and see what he shared just before our focal passage is today, Jesus said, just ask and you will receive. And probably to the ears of some of those there, regrettably to the ears of some today, they think, well, that's a pretty good deal. It's kind of open-ended. Just ask what you want for and you'll get it. All you got to do is just say, give me this eternal life and, and it's ours. And it seems to be, to, to be that invitation that just throws the gate wide open. But in the midst of that, Jesus begins to explain and he says, wait a minute. And he says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. Folks, many in our world today, if you go outside these doors, they'll say, yeah, you know, I've, I've read that Sermon on the Mount. That's a great teaching on ethics. But it's so much more than that. I mean, it's spoken from the heart of God through his Son and given to us. And in it, he tells us about the way that we become part of this relationship. And Jesus shares an illustration that easily be understood by them and by us. He says there's a wide gate. A lot of folks think they can go in there and get in. There's a narrow gate, which is the only way you can get in. So I began to think about that. You know, if you go to a large sporting event and there's thousands of people that are coming, they have these gates that are wide open to let folks come in because of the crowd and anybody can come in that way. A lot of folks today want to think that the way to heaven is like that wide gate. Let me tell you what the narrow gate is. It's a turn, turnstile. You ever been through one of those? One person at a time. You ever try to walk through them with a whole bunch of luggage? No can do. You ever try to drag somebody through it with you? Can't do it. You got to leave it behind. Jesus said, this is narrow. If you want in, this is how you get in. You got to leave self behind. You got to leave all your luggage behind. You got to leave anything that takes precedent over me behind. Because this is a turnstile. It is not a wide open gate through which everybody can come. Bags that are packed full of what we want and the things that we hold at the top of the list need to be left behind. Jesus says, no, this gate is narrow. You know, when the state fair came in the fall, I, I went around and took my granddaughter there and going around. You know, on all those rides, they have this thing that says, you got to be this high to ride it. And I just stand back. I love watching those kids. You know, some would come up and they'd make it. Boy, they'd be so happy. And then you see them come up, they'd be a little bit underneath, or a little bit more underneath, and just so dejected. You know, in some ways, Jesus is doing that right here. 
He says, you've got to measure up to this to get in. These standards don't get lowered. You can't talk your way into being at this point. They are constant, and if you don't have them, you don't get in. And here he's sharing what it takes to get into the kingdom of God. He says you have to repent. You have to turn away from sin and turn to God. You have to leave self behind and submit yourself to the lordship of Jesus Christ. That's this narrow gate. You have to leave behind that which controls you and hinders your devotion to self. And I read this, and I thought about the story that Jesus shared with us about Jesus and the rich young ruler. I got to tell you, folks, that's one of the most mispreached sermons ever. You know, the rich young ruler came to him, and he says, you got to sell whatever you want, give to the poor. You know how it's preached today? you got to be willing to sell what you have and give. To that's not what it says. He told him to go sell it. He didn't say, I want you to be willing to sell it. He said, get rid of it. Because it's holding you down and keeping you from being what you have to be to be part of the kingdom of God. And here he does that again when he shares this narrow gate. But that's not what our culture wants to hear. They want a gospel of self-indulgence. A gospel that condones and not condemns. They want to feel good. An hour a week devotion and a message that says all roads lead to the top. I've shared with you before that during our time in Colorado, Marsha and I were part of the search and rescue. Now, I want to tell you, on my bucket list, there's never been nor will there ever be a line that says, I want to be a mountain climber. I don't like it. In fact, I was the radio operator. I like down here. But I was around a lot of mountain climbers, and we sent up a lot of crews. And I mean, I, I was around them when they just said, hey, let's go climb a 14,000-foot mountain today. And they'd lay their maps out, and they would look at them, and they would figure out how to do it. Let me tell you what I never heard. I never heard any of them say, tell you what, you go over there, I'll go over here. You go over there, we'll all end up at the top. Nobody said, it doesn't matter which way you go. Just head out up there. You'll get there. They knew that there was a safe route, a sure route that had to be taken. And often on some of those mountains, there was one way, and that was it. And regrettably, there were those who decided, I'll make my own way. I'll go another way. And we brought a lot of them down. They thought that all ways, all roads would get them to the top. And in our world today, there's a lot of folks that still think that. They like that I'll do it my way gospel and to make it fit. But notice what Jesus says. He says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. If you read, look at the Greek word for destruction, it means total loss and doom. Ruin. It is eternal separation from God. That's the finale of all of this. It's being totally separated from God. And, and you notice he didn't say there's a whole bunch of gates out there and you can work your way down. He said there's two. That's it. There's a wide gate that will lead you to destruction, the narrow gate that leads you to life through me. And folks, there's a lot of preachers out there who don't preach about the narrow gate. Let's read a little bit further, continuing in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit you will know them. Not by coincidence, Jesus moves from talking about this narrow gate to those who preach something different. And he does it as a warning and shares to them, you better be really careful and you better watch for those out there who will try to mislead you. As you approach those gates, they will try to make that narrow gate something else. And you see a picture that we'll put up here. This is what a wolf in sheep's clothing would look like. Now, let me tell you something. That's a fallacy. When it comes to preaching distorted doctrine, that is not what a wolf in sheep's clothing looks like. Why? Because you can see the wolf. You look up there, there's not any doubt what you're looking at. The, the ravenous wolves that we're talking about here are disguising themselves as sheep, and it's not obvious what they are or who they are at all. 
They hold a Bible in one hand, and from their mouth in the other hand, they preach a gospel totally distorted and diluted from what's in God's Word. They claim a foundation in Scripture, but they'll modify what's there to soothe the ears and soothe the heart. They stand before thousands and say, we all worship the same God, let's just be happy. They try to walk along the edges so they don't offend anyone, and they profess to be true to God's word, but they share an open theology that condones sinful lifestyles. You see, in Jesus' day, it was a problem. Let me tell you, folks, it's a huge problem today because now it's compounded by media and by television and what can get out there. And, and the seeming truthfulness and veracity that comes to somebody because they're on television. And they're able to proclaim and share things that are so far from God's truth. But, God, but Jesus says, that's okay. You're going to know them by their deeds. You'll be able to tell who they are. And we ask ourselves, how do we do that? How can we really know? Well, let me share with you just some of the ways that we'll know. And at the top of that list is the Holy Spirit. For every single believer who has the Holy Spirit in their heart, Jesus said this, he'll guide you into all truth. All truth. And folks do that and they say, well, I got the Holy Spirit and I look at it, I can't tell. You know why you can't tell? Because you're not filled with the Holy Spirit or led by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the filter through which that around us comes in. The problem is that when we're not filled with the Spirit, we got a holy filter. And I don't mean H-O-L-Y. There's big old holes in it, and it won't work because we haven't done that. The second thing is this. We can look to God's Word and use it as the standard. These are the words of Hebrews 5, 12 through 14. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the world of righteous, word of righteousness. For he's a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are full age, that is, notice this, that who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. God tells us that when we invest ourselves in his word, then we have that discernment that comes through it to tell good and evil. But listen carefully. If you think we can keep it on the nightstand or on the shelf, and cross our fingers and suddenly believe that we're going to know that when it comes without reading it and studying it, it won't work. We have to spend time in God's Word. We have to read it in a devotional sense, in a meditative sense, in a study sense, so that we're able to discern what's good and evil around us. And lastly this, it doesn't matter who it is, folks. We can ask ourselves, do they glorify God in all their life? Scripture says this, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, bring glory to God. And I will tell you, if a preacher is more interested in putting his picture on the front of a book and telling you that every day can be a happy day, you better beware. You know, if you check Jesus, he went out among the people. He healed the lame and the blind and the sick. And I would suggest to you, if somebody spends all their time on a stage healing people and never gets out there among the people, and it doesn't bring glory to God, you better beware. Some might think, aren't you being a little hard and judgmental on those people? To which I would say is, you want to find somebody who will give them a pat on the back and say, good job, go find a career politician. They can handle that. God's word says, this is the way it is. You know, and we live in a world in which we're scared to put it out there. We're going to offend somebody. Can you imagine if Jesus had these crowds out there and they're listening attentively and you've got Jewish leaders who are waiting, waiting for a way to get him. And he stares into their face and says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life. And he says, I'm the way. I'm it. I'm the only way that you get there. You see, Jesus was telling them that not all words measure up. Our last verses are from Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus never one time lowered the standards, folks. And I will tell you, 
the standards of the Bible are very high. They are set. And they're often not what the world wants to hear. But we can't bring them down to our level. We can't reduce them from what God has given to us. Because the penalty for doing that is also very high. You see, in Jesus' time, you could address someone as Lord. And it was a matter of respect and honor, but it often went to government officials or to religious leaders. But suddenly when you capitalize that word, and you use it, it takes on a unique meaning. It refers to Jesus Christ himself. And many will make reference to Lord, but not in the sense of his true nature and not in the sense of submission and obedience to who he is and what he tells us to do. And throughout the Bible, we see those who profess one thing with their mouth and believe another thing in their heart. But Jesus knows the heart. We may be able to fool the world, but we can't fool Jesus. You see, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus referred to those who were calling upon their, their deeds for sufficient belief. And if you read this, one of the surprising things is there's nothing in here that said they didn't do that. Nothing that said they didn't prophesy in some form, do the other things. We don't really know. But we do know that Jesus said it won't get you into heaven. Instead, he said they were not sufficient because what was practiced on the outside was not true belief on the inside. And you see, folks, here he gives the most serious and sincere call for belief. This is not a, a, a statement by Jesus to say, ha, ha, all of you are out. It's a statement by Jesus to say, you can get in. But this is the only way to be a part of it. He said, belief shows itself in how we live and speak. It shows itself in how we follow the word of God. And today, much of our world, in fact, in our country, over 50% of the people say they're Christian. But their actions don't show it. Many today will call Jesus Lord, but they'll condone sin and those who continue to live in sin. But Jesus says one day, a certain day, it will catch up with them. Because he says mere words are not enough. I came across a poem by a British poet. His name is John Axingham, and I, I like what he shares. He says, To every man there openeth a way and ways and a way. And the high soul climbs the highway, and the low soul gropes the low. And in between, on the misty flat, the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low, and every man decideth the way his soul shall go. See, Jesus didn't just say the gate, the way is narrow. If you read it, he said, I'm standing there waiting for you. This is the Son of God who says, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. I want you to come in, but you'll come in my way. And my way says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We have to be careful, folks, that we don't fall prey to the wolves of this world who preach a condoning, watered-down gospel that pre pleases self but not God. And instead, I want us to share and focus upon two verses that we shared last week that tell us exactly the way through the narrow gate. Romans 10, 9, and 10 say that if you confess with your heart the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jesus issued that plea and that invitation to all those folks back there. He issues it today. He doesn't say, here's the gate, come up any way you want. He said, here it is, here's the narrow gate, but I want you to come through it. I want you to believe in me as God's only son who lived on this earth, died a sacrificial death from you, and was raised triumphantly from the grave. And I want you to submit yourself to my lordship, my control over your life. Because your life will be more abundant and my father will be glorified. And that's the greatest objective of life. Let me pray with you before our invitation. As you watch these videos, I, I don't know if you've been with us as they've been shared in person or if perhaps they've been given to you and you're watching them at home. Neither event... God's promise is that when we open his word and we read his word that 
uh, it takes on a, a vibrancy and a life because of it coming from his heart. And I pray that's happened today as you've listened to this. I would invite you to continue to be a part of this worship experience. And uh, if you can be with us and listen to these, then uh, be a part of this corporate fellowship and our corporate worship. You'll always be welcome here. And perhaps you're one who, because of uh, a physical condition or something else, you're not able to be with us. But we're blessed in knowing that you're sharing in God's word with us. And we're going to continue to, uh, to share with you and to make available the messages that we share in this place. So you let us know, and we thank you for joining us today.